Hello. Today we are going to talk about triangle relationships and we are going to talk about unit four. So the first thing we're going to review is our triangle sum theorem. So our triangle sum theorem tells us that the measures of the angle of a triangle always equal 180 degrees. No matter what kind of triangle we ever have, it's always going to equal 180 degrees. So the triangle is always 180 degrees. So here I have some expressions. So I want to find out what x is. So I know when I put these three angles together, it has to equal 180 degrees. When I have this little box here, we know that's 90 degrees. So I can say 90 plus the 5x minus 2 plus 3x plus 4 equals 180. Now I just got to solve for x. Let me combine my like terms. So 8x, then I have what? 90 plus 92 equals 180. Subtract my 92 from my 180. So 8x equals 88 divide by 8, and my x equals 11. My exterior angle theorem tells me that the two non-adjacent interior angles added together equal the third angle's exterior angle, which means that the angle on the exterior equals the two non-adjacent angles added together. So, 19x plus 3 equals 11x minus 2 plus 9x plus 1. Let me clean up my side. Bring my, bring my 19x over here, so I just have x. I'm going to add my 1 to both sides here, so x equals 4. Now this one right now is number 2, sorry. Number 3. I didn't number them when I made it, so I'm going to number it as we go along. So here it tells me L is parallel to M. I like my little arrows. Remember, the arrows mean they're parallel. So now I want to find x and I want to find y. So now I've got some stuff going on here. So let's see what's going on. So to find my x or to find my y, I have to set up a plan here. So if I'm looking at these two being parallel, right here I'm going to have my consecutive interior angles. We know that the consecutive interior angles equal 180 degrees which means that 7x minus 31 plus 63 plus 5x minus 8 is going to be equal to 180 degrees because my consecutive interior angles are supplementary. So let me clean this up. Subtract 24 from both sides. X equals 13. Now I can use that information now to find Y. So with that here, still going with my parallel theme right here, when I'm looking at Y, do, 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 do. Y and this whole angle are alternate interior, but I can find this angle here after I find this because they'll be like not a linear pair, but it'll be it'll be a, it'll be 180 because it's a line. So let's figure out what this angle is first. So five times 13 minus eight. So he's 57 degrees right here. So I know this whole thing, because he's a straight line right here, 
has to be 180 degrees. So 180 minus the 57 minus the 63 should be 60 degrees right here. Now with that, when I'm looking at this right here, this is a transversal. These two guys are alternate interior angles. So with those two being alternate interior angles, they're congruent. So 4y plus 27 should equal the 60 plus the 63. It's a whole angle. So 4y plus 27 equals 123. So y is 24. The second thing we talked about was our mid-segment theorem, or the mid-segment of a triangle. We know when we have a mid-segment. A mid-segment is when I take one side of my triangle and I find the midpoint. I take the other side of my triangle and I find a midpoint. When this happens, the non-midpointed side becomes a relationship with that segment in the middle. So here, this segment becomes half of this, um, this third side. So 7x is 1 half of 17x minus 18. So now I can either A, clear my fraction, or B, distribute. I'm going to clear my fraction. So 14, that means, that means I multiply everything by 2. So that'll cancel out. So 14x equals 17x minus 18. I'm going to bring my 17 over, so negative 3x equals negative 18, divide by negative 3, so my x is 6. Didn't ask you to find x, but that's what we're going to find for number 4, sorry. Number 5 took the different route and said, hey, you still had the mid-segment, we know we still won half of the bottom side, but when we find that mid-segment, that mid-segment and that bottom are parallel to each other. So now if I want to find angles, I use my reasons of things being parallel. So if I want to find x and y, x right here is now a consecutive interior. So x and 100 equal 180 degrees. y and 80 are corresponding. They are congruent, so y actually equals 80 degrees as well. Because corresponding angles are, these are corresponding angles, they're congruent. And these are consecutive interior. Which equals 180. They're only basically going to be your corresponding or your consecutive interior. They're not going to be at this point, they could be alternate interior, well they couldn't be alternate interior, because you have to have a diagonal this way. Um, they really only can be these two for your five reasons lines are parallel. You're not going to have your alternate exterior. You're not going to have consecutive exterior. So really you only have the consecutive interior and the corresponding angles that they can be. And he's 180 and he's congruent. Sorry, I'm stuck on the thing. All right, the next thing we talked about was a perpendicular bisector, which basically everybody's congruent. <clears throat> says if I drop this bisector, which is the 90 degree angle, when he bisects the two bottoms are congruent, and I have a point that's equidistant to each end point, which is right here, then my two sides are congruent, so x equals 10. By the converse of the perpendicular bisector theorem, it says that, hey, if I have this perpendicular bisector, and I have a, perpendic a perpendicular, and I've got this point, and I can, I, to the end points, both sides are congruent, then these guys right here must be congruent as well. So x plus 5 must equal 2x plus 10. Solve for x. And this was number 6. Sorry, these became congruent. 
with the angle bisector, it's the same, same deal for number seven. Here, I have an angle. I bisected it. That's what's here. They're both congruent. If I drop this perpendicular, which is the shortest distance to the side, they must both be congruent. So again, x would equal 10. If I have an angle and it's been cut in half and the perpendicular drop to the side is congruent, then these angles must be on a bisector, up next there, sorry, so x must be 35 degrees. Pretty straightforward. All right, number eight. How do I know I'm a triangle? To determine if I'm a triangle, as we said before, the two smaller ang or two smaller sides have to be larger than the third side. Because basically, I got to have a little pup in the tent, right? They can't be the same. If they're the same, it would just be on top of each other. So this guy's got to be bigger to have some length come up to have a third side put on. So I'm going to take the two smaller angles, and when I add them together, they have to be larger than the third side. That's that, that triangle inequality theorem says. So with that, 8 plus 17 gives me 25. So 25 is greater than 24, so therefore, yes, it is a triangle. When I come to the second example on number 8, I, have, I take my two smallest angles, two smallest sides, excuse me, so I have 12 plus 11 has to be greater than 24. Well, 12 plus 11 is only 23. Is that greater than 24? Nope. So it is not a triangle. That simple. I could check. The theorem actually says you check all the sides, but if the two smallest sides, if you check those, the other ones have to fall into play because you're going to have that big angle thrown in. Now I want to find the range of my third side. To find the range of my third side, remember we're trying to find what are the possible things. That's when we're going to have now the compound inequality, where it's going to say that x is larger than somebody, but he's smaller than somebody else. To find this, remember this end, we subtract the two numbers to be smaller. So 11 minus 3 gives me 8. So x has to be larger than 8, but I add to get this end right here. 11 plus 3 is 14. So the, the range of my third side is, a, is, is a, uh, x has to be larger than 8 but less than 14. It cannot be 8 and it cannot be 14. Larger than 8, smaller than 14. Okay, I want to order the sides of my triangle. Sorry, that was number nine. I want to order the sides of my triangle from least to greatest. <clears throat> Remember we talked about that. How our angle opens, I can't, do this the, I can't do this on the thing. How my angle opens determines the side over here. It's a little opening, I have a little side. A big opening is going to give me a big side because the side is directly across from the angle. So, when I'm looking at my angles, the smallest angle across from it produces the smallest side. The largest angle across from it or opposite of it produces the largest side. So if I want to order my angle or order by my sides, then here of least to greatest, be careful because sometimes they change that, that Least would be my smallest, so it would be B, C. My medium one would be my one in the middle, A, B. And then my largest angle, sorry, largest side, sorry, A, C. Just taking that backwards now, 
The largest side produces the largest angle. The smallest side produces the smallest angle. So here is my smallest side, so C has to be my smallest angle. 13 is my largest side, so B has to be my largest angle. So if I'm going to order my angles from least to greatest, again, always check, be angle C, angle A, angle B. B's in the middle. Then today we did the extension with the hinge theorem. So with my hinge theorem, it said, okay, two sides were the same, so therefore, if two sides of my triangle are the same, what is the relationship of the third side? We have to look at the hinge or the angle between them. So here, when I look at my angle, he goes to side AC. When I look at my angle, he goes to side DF. So now that I have, I'm looking at them comparing the two angles. Remember, I'm comparing the two sides. Remember, they are congruent here, so these are going to drive the relationship for the third side. So here, 79 is larger than 74, so AC is larger than DF. This does the same thing with my angle, with my angles. If I'm looking at these two here, I've got congruent side, congruent side, congruent side, congruent side. So now I'm looking here at the third side. Drives my angle or my hinge in the middle. So the comparison for angle D and angle H is that angle D would have to be larger because the measure of the side is larger, which makes sense. He's opening bigger, he's got to be a bigger angle. We don't know his measure. We just know he's going to be larger than whatever H is. We don't know the measure. We just know he's larger. That's it. And then the last thing we did today was we found all the possible values of X, which then created our range. Because remember, it's going to make a range for us. When we did this today, we had to look at all three sides of the triangle. When we looked at all three sides of the triangle, then we could determine um, what the range of X would be to make this triangle work. You don't have to draw the triangle, I'm just drawing it. So we're looking at this, we're looking at the possible values of X to make it happen. If there are angles on the inside, it's super easy because angles are stuck into the pattern of they gotta be 180. Sides are not. Sides can be whatever measure we want them to be. So, it doesn't matter if it's 180 degrees inside. So remember, there was three things that we did. So we said, hey, that theorem we did in the very beginning, the triangle sum, that triangle sum theorem, sorry, the triangle equality theorem said, the two sides have to be bigger than the third. So I know that AB plus BC has to be larger than AC. But I also have to check. I know that AB plus AC has to be larger than BC. And I also have to check, I have BC plus AC has to be larger than AB. So these should be the three different sides I have. Now I gotta put in my math and see how this works. So let's see. I have 4X plus 25 plus 3X minus two has to be larger than 9X minus five. So let's solve this, because two are going to come out pretty, one's going to come out wonky. So 7x plus 23 has to be larger than 9x minus 5. So let's see, I'm going to bring the 9x over to this side, so subtract the 9x makes negative 2x plus 23 has to be greater than negative 5. I'm going to subtract 23 from both sides, which means negative 23 minus five is gonna be 28, so negative two X is greater than negative 28. Divide by negative two, don't forget when I divide by that negative, he flips, so I have X greater than 14. 
for that answer. All right, let's look at the next side. Got to do for all three, long, boring, and tedious. Got to do for all three sides. So 4x plus 25 plus 9x minus 5 has to be greater than 3x minus 2. So 9, 13x plus 20 has to be greater than 3x minus 2. Bring my 3x over, subtract my 20. So I have 10x is greater than negative 22. So when I divide by 10, I get negative 22 tenths, which makes some decimal. Might not be the answer we're looking for. Remember, I told you these come out to pretty numbers. So he might be our yucky guy. But let's try our next one here because you still have to get a range. We still got to do them. So 3x minus 2 plus 9x minus 5 has to be greater than 4x plus 25. All right, so if I subtract 4 from both sides, I'm going to add 7 to both sides. 7 is what? 20? Oops, sorry. I got a yucky on my calculator. Hold on. 32, divide by 8, and I get 4. All right, so now I told you one's a yucky doesn't count. These two should make the inequality. And if you look at it, because the inequality is going to be a double compound inequality, I have here x is less than 14. So my bigger number should be down here anyway. Here, x is less than 14 fits. Here, I have x is greater than 4. x is greater than 4. That's the same thing as x is greater than 4 if I write it this way. x is greater than 4. So that is my range of possibilities of x. For the equation. That's what covers everything that's on this test. Shouldn't be too bad of a test, but that covers everything on the test. If you have any questions, just see me. Have a great day.